detailed stuff. Uh, this is the second uh, detailed team, and this is Soul Engineering. For the North Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome presenters. This is the system verification review for Soul System Engineering's project orders. That's orbital debris removal system. All right, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce the team first so they don't have to introduce themselves. We have Scott McClellan, our assistant project manager, Patrick Deskin, the lead for structures, Colville Lightly, the lead for the additive control and determination subsystem, and we have Nicholas Sullivan, the lead for the power and tracking subsystem. Our other engineers include Jacob Menania, Christine Aspie, Juan Ma, Talon Larkin, Chris Mitchell, and Joseph Talbot. Okay. All right. This graphic presents a personnel structure for our teams. You can see how we were organized. All right, so the order of our presentation, first we'll discuss a brief overview and a little history of the project. We'll go into the <coughs> subsystem verification analysis for each subsystem. ADAC and tracking will be combined as their testing was related. And then we'll go into integration where we talk about the system level and configuration management. And lastly, a conclusion with an overview of our final overview of our project. <coughs> All right, so our project was inspired by a modern trend in the space industry where debris in Earth's orbit has become an issue, not only for satellites currently in orbit, but for vehicles soon to be launched. Um, ideally, we wanted to reduce or remove the debris from near Earth orbit. Uh, we imagined a system that would be able to target and track debris while dynamically maintaining its stability and then being able to operate autonomously other than a user input that we added for as a safety measure. A history of our project, back in preliminary design, we covered the mission design and mission requirements, which ultimately got de-scoped into the system design and system requirements. Uh, last semester, we went into our preliminary design. Then this semester for detail, AE445, we first started with our critical design review, which allowed us to enter into ordering parts and then fabrication, and lastly, testing. That brings us to today, verifying that we met our requirements. So, above, or presented above me is a picture of the subsystem. Uh, you can also see it displayed here to my right. Uh, just so it gives you an idea of what this thing looks like, you're gonna see the design referenced many times, or at least the the size and the shape of the structure, and we just wanted to make it clear that it's the same object. Okay, so for our concept of operation, there's three main phases. First, we have the stabilization phase, which includes scanning. So uh, when the system starts up, it needs to remain stable. The second phase is tracking and targeting, where when a target is presented to the system, it locks onto the target as it's moving and then follows the moving target. And then lastly is an engagement phase where the user would be prompt to engage the target. We wouldn't want the system uh, identifying a false target or being able to target and potentially affect an object that was on an, uh, an orbit which we did not like. Okay, one give you uh, above is a simulation, uh, an early simulation of what the project would look like in operation. Uh, you can see the red line there is the camera, or what the camera would be viewing. And first there was the scanning phase, where it was scanning for an object. Next you'll see an object presented, and once it sees the object, it locks on and begins tracking it. As the object moves, the system follows, and then the object is removed, and the system goes back into the scanning phase. A breakdown of our subsystems. First we have the structural subsystem, then we'll get, go into attitude control and determination, next into tracking, and then finally into the electrical power subsystem. Up next will be Patrick Deskin to talk about the structure. Thank you, Clayton. Clayton said, I am Patrick Deskin. I am the structural lead for our 
structure subsystem. Here are a list of our requirements for the structure. As you see, we have um, width and length and depth, so that's just the overall measurement and size of the structure. But the two main critical requirements that uh, we analyze for structural strength and uh, rigidity. We also have requirements to ensure that all the other subsystems uh, can be mounted onto the structure. We also have an accessibility requirement just for ease of access to other subsystems to uh, work during the designing process. We have a sharp edge of safety since a lot of people will be, were handling this to put place it on the air bearing, take it off, and do other work. And we also have our weight and cost requirements. So our first analysis, critical analysis was the structural strength. Uh, we conducted three main analyses, which was the overall structure, uh, also a wall bending analysis, and the bottom plate analysis, because these were deemed the critical areas where the structure could possibly fail. Uh, for the analysis, we put a 60 pound load on the top edge of the outer walls, 60 pounds distributed, not on each wall. And we also had 60 pounds uh, on the normal to the face of the outer walls. And here we use uh, Katia to do a finite element analysis. And from uh, that result, we had max stress of 81.2 PSI. Now from the actual test, we did not want to compromise the structure. So we used the same composite specimen that we used to uh, fabricate the structure. Uh, and we have a load being applied to the center of the composite because that's where we have the heaviest uh, component, which is the solenoid. And the solenoid obviously doesn't weigh up to 40 pounds, which is what we tested to for uh, these different orientations. But still, we wanted to see the capability of how much of the composite can handle. So from this picture, we have our zero degree orientation with the load in the vertical pulling downward. We also rotated counterclockwise 90 degrees to have uh, to represent a load moving in the horizontal direction. And uh, our max tested stress was 44 psi, giving us a large margin of safety. You may be wondering, why is it so large? Why did you design it? The reason for that is because the cost of material was driving the design behind the structure. And all the material on that structure we were able to get for free through Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And it was readily available to us. The next analysis was structural <coughs> rigidity. And the three same analyses done for structural strength we did for displacement as well. And we also used the uh, CATIA finite element analysis tool. We had a maximum displacement of 9.86 times 10 to the negative fifth inch. Now from our test here, as we used sandbags to weight, but we loaded each of the outer walls up to 20 pounds for each wall uh, to see the displacement. And the diagram on the top right here is the placement of each of the displacement transducers, which we used to measure displacement with. And if you notice on our graph here, we're missing transducer number one because it was a faulty transducer giving inaccurate voltage readings. So the data from that transducer was ruled out. And the maximum displacement was 0 0.044 inches, which falls well under our maximum allowable displacement of a tenth of an inch. So for our overall analysis of these list of requirements, we have met both in theory and in reality uh, of these requirements. And the same goes for tracking substance amounts of accessibility, sharp edge safety. But however, there was one requirement we didn't meet was the weight requirement. We we're over by three quarters of a pound. But because this weight is an estimation for the structure, and also since we have management reserves to account for the unaccounted for material is not, it does not pose any threat to the overall system requirements. And then from our analysis and experimentation, uh, improvements that could be done is to create uh, mortgage test stands to avoid inaccurate <coughs> readings. Uh, also have more weight to test the full capability of the structure or our test specimens. 
And also having additional instruments such as strain gauges and displacement transducers to avoid faulty instruments, but also to get a better idea of the readings of the focal structure. I will now pass it off to Koval Wetley to discuss ADAC and tracking. All right, thank you, Pat. Uh, as you said, I'm the ADAC subgroup lead. I'll be going over ADAC and the tracking subsystems. Uh, we are doing both these subsystems together for this presentation because during the detailed process, both subsystems were directly dependent on each other. So first, I'm going to go through the requirements for the ADAC subsystem. We had 18 total requirements. The first nine are seen on this table. These are the controller and IMU requirements. You can see uh, which design metrics we use to verify these requirements and their required values. Uh, this next table shows the final uh, eight requirements. So we had 17 total. Um, and the first six being data flow requirements for our controller uh, to our system, and then also a weight and budget requirement. For tracking, we had five total requirements. First three being angle determination requirements, and the final two also being a weight and budget for the subsystem. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about the configuration for these subsystems. First, the ADAC subsystem, there's uh, two configurations. The first being the data flow configuration, which is seen on the left of the slide. Uh, it brings in the information from the IMU using a USB hub, and then using the computer, um, which has our controller on it, will determine a firing sequence that is then sent out through the same USB hub to a lab jack, which then sends it out to the solenoids, which is part of our cold gas thruster network, which is our mechanical configuration, which is seen on the right of the slide. Uh, this, as I said, is cold gas thrust network. We use compressed air from an off-board source uh, to control our roll pitch and yaw. For the tracking configuration, we brought in information from the camera, again through the same USB hub, to the computer where our controller was at, and with the ADAC information, we created a firing sequence during our tracking phase, which then again, as I said before, was sent out to the cold gas thruster network. Um, so then, before we built our system, we did some analysis for each subsystem. For the ADAC subsystem, we created a Simulink model in MATLAB seen on this screen. Uh, the red boxes are the controller that would actually control our system, and the, all the blue ones were to simulate our system. So looking at our controller, we brought in, for the Q target, the Q observed from our system. Uh, this then determined a Q target position for our two phases, the scanning and tracking phase. As you can see, there is no tracking information being brought in for the simulation. This is because inside this block, we are simulating what the tracking angles it would give us. So this is sent to our Q air block that will take our observed position with our target position, find uh, the air, and send that into our controller with the angular velocity and an M and D value, which is used in a dead band controller equation to determine a firing sequence for roll, pitch, and yaw. This will then be sent out to the system, so that's where it ends our controller. But for this simulation, we had a torque creator block, which took our firing sequence and determined what torque would be produced on our system, which then is sent out to a vehicle dynamics block, which simulated the motion of our system, and then that was sent through a simulated IMU block, which took the information from the spec sheet from the IMU we had picked at the time, uh, that met all the requirements, and then this is all again sent back into the controller. For the tracking analysis, we created a MATLAB script that found a continuous red object. From this object, it found the centroid of the object and then determined uh, using pixels from the center of the camera, the angle to the centroid of the object, which was then sent to the ADAC controller uh, used for controlling the system. Uh, so we took this um, tracking code and created a simulating function here so since the function used a while loop and that would not give us at every time step, we had to bring in the picture from a video device uh, at every time step with the uh, red, green, and blue matrices we were put into our tracking script, which is from before, just minus the while loop to determine a uh, three values, an angle, a phase, and a presence. The phase was either a zero for scanning phase or one for tra tracking phase. <coughs> So this was done by bringing in the value and in the decision block, once a one came in, so once we found an object, the phase remained in the targeting phase for the rest of the test, and then the presence was only used during the tracking phase. This was to say if there was any uh, an object in view. This is if the system goes past the object due to overshoot, it'll um, alert that it did that and it'll go back to the last known position to find the object. So these are sent into the controller blocks, which are the same 
from the simulation two slides ago, minus the tracking simulation in the cube target, which brings in information from the IMU function, which actually used C code um, that was translated into MATLAB to um, bring in the data. And then this controller determined a uh, firing sequence, which was then sent out to the lab jack using the yellow function block. So then we looked and compared our analysis results to our experimental results. Uh, first, we looked at the force produced by our nozzles, since this was two of requirements. We first designed the shape of our nozzle, and then using a CFD model, we put a simulated air force, uh, air pressure into the nozzle using the atmospheric pressure to determine the force of the nozzle. Uh, for roll and pitch, it was determined that we would need a pressure between 15 and 20 psi to reach that required force, and for yaw, a 20 to 30 psi. The required forces for roll and pitch was 0.06 pounds force, and for yaw, it was 0.1 pounds force per nozzle. So then we uh, compare this to our experimental results, as you can see from the tables. The top table being roll and pitch, you can see it's able to meet the 0.06 pounds force in between the 15 and 20. And for yaw, it meets the 0.1 pounds force between 20 and 30 for the positive yaws, and uh, at 30 for the negative yaws. So this was able to meet both our requirements. Then we looked at the tracking analysis compared to experimental results. So this came directly from our uh, MATLAB script, so you can see that it's able to target the object. It has a green circle around and a blue uh, star that's in the middle to indicate the centroid. We also found the max range, which was 23 feet, which was well above our requirement. Then comparing this to our experimental results, as you can see, the range was lower for this. It was only 16 feet, but this was only because the uh, testing range only went out to 16 feet, as you can see from the picture, the object is right at the end of the range. Um, and this time it is circled by a blue and white circle with a blue cross of the centroid showing it again can track the object. So we took this and we looked at our Simulink model for the scanning and tracking phase. For this is the, for the simulation Simulink. As you can see, the uh, yaw goes between negative 90 and 90. And so once it passed 80 degrees, so we gave us 10 degrees for overshoot on our system, I would switch to the negative position to continue scanning. Um, looking at the tracking, we brought in an angle, and this angle came from our tracking analysis uh, two slides ago, so this was the first angle there. Uh, they added, you add it to the observed position to get our desired position, and then fire correctly to reach that angle. Uh, so then we compared this to experimental results. This came from an actual test um, that we ran. So looking, the first difference you can see is the yaw angles for the desired position only go from positive 30 to negative 25, which is much lower than our plus or minus 90 from our simulation. But this is only because our testing area only had the limited 55 degree range. And, but you can see once it passes the 20 degrees, so 10 degrees off of the 30 again, it will switch back, counting for overshoot, and it will continue to scan between these two angles. Uh, for the tracking, this was taken from one time step uh, you can see the angle was then added to the observed position to get a new desired position. This time you notice that the, it fires in positive, although it's a negative position. This is because before this, it was trying to go to the negative 25 desired position, and then switching to negative 14, the angular velocity was so high that it has to fire in the positive position to slow itself down to engage the target. So. Uh, from this, the simulation and the actual test results, we looked at our stability graphs. For roll and pitch, you can see they were able to stay between the plus or minus 5 degrees uh, requirement that we had, and then it gives you a good graphic of the scanning phase. And then the tracking phase, we had uh, the object go back and forth on a, on a single plane, so that's, where you, that's what you see right there. So we compared this to our experimental results. Again, we were able to stay within our plus or minus 5 degrees. Values were uh, pretty close to our simulated results. Um, you can also see that there is a lot more noise during this system. Uh, this is due to disturbance torques. And then you also see a, uh, the scanning and tracking phase, again, a lot more noise. And the scanning phase does not go as high at, uh, as much of a range as the simulation. So going over summary of our subsystems, uh, you can first see, again, the nine requirements. These are the controller and IMU. We predicted to meet them for the analysis. And then we actually were able to verify them during experimental results, meeting all nine of these. For the six data flow requirements for the ADAC subsystem, we were also predicted to meet them all, and we verified them during tests. 
and we're also able to meet our weight and budget requirements for our subsystem. For the tracking subsystem, as you can see, we were predicted to meet the uh, <coughs> results during our analysis, and then we were able to verify them again during experimental results. Although these values were not as good as they were in the analysis, they still met requirements. Also, again, able to meet our weight and budget. For some improvements for ADEC, the controller, uh, with more time, it can always be improved with more tuning. Um, also, since we used a dead band controller because our solenoids only worked on and off, it would have been nice to use, say, an LQR where we could vary the force coming out. Um, also use reaction wheels, which we could not afford. Um, it would have given us better control over the system. Also, the air source, since we had an off-board air source, we had an umbilical cord. You can see we connect to the top there. Uh, this caused a lot of issues because if it was not con um, not contained there, it would go back and forth, making our system unstable, so uncontrolled. And then when you keep it rigid, uh, we do lose some movement in roll and pitch, which was also not ideal. So we would like to have had uh, onboard tanks, but cost and um, having that much pressure on a system was not ideal when we had an off-board source available. For tracking, uh, adequate light was important. If there was too much light or not enough light, it would not see the object. Uh, this was a big problem as we saw during the uh, one of the tests, the object went straight under the light and the camera lost the object until it passed the light. Um, so we would have to uh, tune the cameras to be able to uh, be able to track the object. For this problem, we solved it by putting a visor on our target. And now I'm going to pass it off to Jacob to talk about how. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, all right, so electrical power. Uh, here is the configuration of the electrical power subsystem. Uh, you have batteries. You have batteries here which feed power into a power board. The batteries operate at 22.3 volts nominal voltage, and they have the power board has to convert that to 12 volts, which is required by the solenoid. So I have here a list of requirements for the electrical power subsystem. Battery capacity, we had to provide at least enough power for one and a half hours of operation. That was so that way we could have enough runtime to do multiple tests without having to recharge each time. Um, our power, uh, each power rail has to supply at least 30 watts, and that's because the uh, solenoids are very high power devices. Uh, and lastly, the power system shall not overheat, so that way it doesn't fail, obviously. Um, other requirements are voltage regulation, 12 volts plus or minus 2 volts. The voltage is not very critical for solenoids as they're basically coils. Um, they have to provide, each power rail has to provide 2.8 amps of current. That is the cold start voltage for these particular solenoids. Uh, actually, the, the cold start voltage is slightly below that, but that's with a margin of safety included. Uh, must weigh less than 10 pounds, and the system must cost less than $100. Uh, so here is the battery capacity analysis that we did. Uh, so the uh, required runtime was one and a half hours. The nominal voltage of the batteries is 22.2 volts. Three and a half hours of nominal capacity that gives us a nominal energy of 66.6 watt hours. We are using two batteries in parallel. Since we're using them in parallel, we can count that as 133.2 watt hours. Uh, our expected power usage at a 50% duty cycle, assuming that the solenoids are only firing 50% of the time, gives us 76 watt hours right here. And we can meet the, uh, per the capacity requirement at a duty cycle of up to 63%. Uh, so in, <coughs> sorry about that, in testing or uh, in analysis, the 133.2 watt hours exceeds the 76 watt hour requirement to hit uh, for the one and a half hour runtime. And in actual testing, the system ran more than double that runtime because of the analysis we did was a worst case analysis, assuming that everything was basically basically using the maximum amount of power all the time. So uh, we far exceeded that uh, in testing. So here is our next requirement, peak power handling. Uh, we needed to provide at least 30, 30 watts per rail. We were able to provide 33 watts per rail there. As you can see, this is our simulated value, and this is our typical measured value. Um, here is uh, a uh, TI webbench analysis of the uh, one power rail at maximum capacity. Here you can see that the hottest point is the actual integrated circuit, and that's at around 80, uh, 71 degrees C. Um, here is the 
the actual numbers from the uh, simulation. Here's the design temperatures, the maximum simulated temperature, <coughs> and the typical measured temperatures. As you can see, the typical measured temperatures are much higher, and that's because the simulation assumes a four-plane uh, or a four-layer circuit board with much heavier copper than what we were able to afford. Uh, these particular ICs use the copper planes as uh, heat sinks. So that would explain the slightly higher temperature, but we're still under the threshold temperature. So uh, next is voltage regulation. We needed 12 volts plus or minus 2 volts. Um, and our input voltage was slightly lower, and that's because the design was for 24 volts max, which is giving us a little wiggle room uh, for the input. The output uh, went to around 10.55 volts, that's under load. So the main reason why that happened was because of the loading from the relays. And uh, we did not measure the output peak to peak ripple voltage or the settling time of those, and that's just, uh, that was just additional information that we could see in the simulation, but there, there was no requirement to test that. Uh, design metric is, next design metric is weight. And uh, of note here is we have allotted uh, 0.25 pounds for the printed circuit board, but the actual weight of the circuit board was 0.8 pounds, but the surface mount components were all weighed while they were mounted on the sur on onto the circuit board, and we allotted one pound for surface mount components. Uh, that was just a number that we picked. Uh, it seemed to be a reasonable number. So our total weight of the surface mount components and the circuit board was 0.8 pounds. As such, our total weight for the system came in much under budget at 3.625 pounds. Our next metric is cost. We have 203 components in the electrical power subsystem. Um, the total cost of the components is approximately, well, well $94.55. Uh, many of those components were sourced from the Department of Engineering, uh, and so we were able to get our actual team cost down to $43.32. Here is a picture of the assembled power board. Of note, our power connectors for the batteries, uh, fuse holders, these are the individual power rails. There are four 12-volt power rails and one 5-volt auxiliary power rail. The auxiliary power rail is not a part of our system design. It was just used to power a USB hub that was mounted on our system, but we had int uh, initially intended to power that with a wall board uh, externally. Uh, here are our relays, and those are solid-state relays. They're LED-controlled MOSFETs, and uh, here are, here's the output. The IMU has not been mounted here yet, but it, it, that's where its final mounting location is. Uh, so our design metric table, we were able to satisfy our capacity, uh, our power requirement, our overheating requirement, our uh, voltage regulation requirement. We were able to satisfy our uh, current protection requirement with fuses. We were able to satisfy the weight requirement and the cost requirement. Uh, so um, on Friday, after Thanksgiving, I got a, uh, I received a communication saying that uh, one of our uh, engineers had inadvertently made contact with the power board, uh, inadvertently connected the batteries in the inverted polarity. Um, as many people know that uh, integrated circuits don't often handle anything they're not intended to do very gracefully. So um, fuses don't protect against reverse current, uh, especially when it only takes a few hundred milliamps to burn these things out in the wrong direction. So um, we had to make an emergency order, and they were fixed. They were repaired miraculously on Tuesday. And uh, it works again. The system is now once again fully functional. Um, and so <coughs> improvements and recommendations uh, the batteries were at one point run below the critical voltage for LiPo batteries. The LiPo ba batteries should not be discharged below 3.3 volts per cell. Um, and they were uh, accidentally left on it, I believe, overnight, and that drained the batteries significantly. We were able to recover that. So in the future, uh, if I was using LiPo batteries, I would design uh, an under voltage protection circuit to prevent uh, uh, low discharge. Next, I would, since they were connected in reverse polarity and that blew out the circuit, I would add reverse voltage protection circuitry. But a lot of that is time limitation and cost limitation. Uh, next, I'm going to be passing this on to Scott McClellan for integration. 
Thank you, Jacob. As you said, I am Scott Klein. I'll be going over integration, which goes over system level test analysis. Uh, first off, I want to go through the test area setup. We had our camera looking for red objects, and you'd be surprised how many red objects there are in the Space Systems Lab. So we had to take extra precautions to eliminate the possibility of a camera red objects. Therefore, we had curtains, uh, basically black bed sheets that you can buy at Walmart, clothespins to a string that went from one shelf to the center post to another shelf over here, basically creating a 90 degree wall that we could keep the system in. Also, as was mentioned in ADAC, we had the need to uh, make more rigid the air hose connecting into the umbilical system, so we were able to move it over one of the rafters and then use wire to keep it steady, which did limit our movement a bit, but eliminated the majority of the disturbance torques that we experienced. We had a total of eight system requirements going over targeting, tracking, communications, weight, operation time. We had a safety zone requirement and our budget. We were able to meet all these requirements. And when we verified each of these requirements and tests, we went through analysis and testing. And Christina will be going more in depth with the analysis. Thank you, Scott. Again, my name is Christina Aspie, and I will be going over system level testing. The very first test that I'm going to go over is the control test run. The purpose of this test was primarily to determine whether or not the control system would actually be capable of keeping plus or minus five degrees in roll and pitch while in all of the different phases of our mission, be it tracking, targeting, or just the scanning phase. So as you can see from the table above me, these show the farthest roll and pitch angles, and these are within our plus or minus five degrees of accuracy. This is a graphical representation um, that also shows that we were within our plus or minus five degrees of accuracy. Um, this test was done while tracking, so as you can see here, the angles were set to the system. If a negative angle is shown, you can see that the firing was in the negative yaw nozzles, and if it was a positive angle, then the positive nozzles were firing. So it was correcting itself in yaw while staying dynamically stable within plus or minus five degrees. The next test I'm gonna go over is the yaw angle test, and this was to determine how many yaw angles we were able to bring in from our system per second. So this system, or this test was run at for 23.3 seconds, and in this amount of time, we were able to pull in 221 angles, giving us an angle determination rate of 9.5 hertz. The requirement for this was 9 hertz plus or minus 1 hertz, so we were within our requirement for this test. The next test is the data collection test, and this was used to make sure that our system was able to store data into MATLAB and then return IMU data back to the system so that the system would be able to autonomously decide where it wanted to go in order to track the objects. So as you can see here, it gives position and velocity in degrees and radians per second, uh, respectively, and the necessary firing sequences in order to accomplish this. Uh, the next test was the weight test. Um, this was simply done by measuring each component of each subsystem and then adding everything together. So in total, adding the weight of the camera, the power subsystem, the attitude determination and control, and the structures, we ended up with a weight of about 33.55 uh, pounds. Uh, in analysis, we estimated about 32.5 pounds, um, but our requirement was that it needed to be under 40 pounds, so we met our requirement. The next test is the safety zone inspection test. We care about safety, and the <coughs> main concern was that if anything were to happen, the system would fall off the air bearing, and we did not want to have anyone within a six foot radius of the system if this happened. So our requirement was to have a six foot radius that people could stand away from the system. We were given an ample amount of space for our testing area. So here you can see our testing area. The sheets are in the um, boundaries of the testing zone, and we were given a 12 foot wide and 16 foot long area for this which was well greater than our six foot radius for safety. Um, next was the full systems test, which was essentially everything being run at the same time to make sure that our mission was being met. Um, it was communicating properly with MATLAB um, and staying stable while targeting and tracking objects. 
So as you can see here, when the positive angle is uh, given to the system, the positive yaw is going in negative angle, the negative yaw is firing. So it's tracking the yaw uh, and at a, or an angle determination rate of 9.5 hertz. Um, here you can see that we were going within uh, 30 degrees or negative 62 degrees. So we were only scanning within a 92 degree angle. This was just due to our testing area um, and where we were able to do this test. And we were within our five degrees, uh, plus or minus five degrees of accuracy in the image. Next is the average power test. And this was essentially to make sure that we would be able to run three full system tests of 30 minutes each and have an operation time of 1.5 hours without the batteries um, dying. So we did several system tests and determined that the batteries were able to run for six hours, and the batteries weren't even done at this point, but six hours is much higher than the required operation time of 1.5 hours, so we stopped testing after this. And last is our cost. So this was simply done by adding up the cost from the different subsystems. So from adding structures, attitude determination, tracking, power and integration, the total came out to $1,012.69. We were allotted $1,200 for this project and expected to use about $1,100, so we were under budget. So in summary, out of all of the system level requirements, which are shown here, we were able to verify all of them and all of them were satisfied. And next I'm going to pass it back to Scott for configuration management. Thank you, Christina. Um, configuration management, as you heard in the last presentation, is a document covering how the structures, um, all the systems are built and put together. Um, this is our product structure tree. We have a total of five different subsystems, including ADAC, the electrical power system, tracking, um, support equipment, which includes a test area, the air bearing stand, um, things that don't go directly on the system itself, and the structure. And each of these, um, have their own sub-assemblies associated with them, according to their needs. We're going to look at the overall system spec sheet. As you can see, it includes the air bearing, the structure, and the ADAC, and it has call-outs for each of them, and in the bill of materials, it lists all of them as well. And we're going to look specifically at the structure. This is the structure subsystem overall assembly. As you can see, we have a lot of different parts put together in this structure to keep everything together, make everything easily replaceable, easily modifiable. And again, has call-outs for each of the individual parts and the spec sheet and in the bill of materials listing of how many of each one we use. We're going to look at the bottom plate, which is, the, as the name describes, the bottom plate of the structure. And uh, as you can see, it has measurements for every dimension, including the thickness, the distance between the air part, the outer part and the distances of each of the outer walls. And also gives you a reference picture to let you know what it would look like in a 3D view. We also have a call out because um, a lot of brass inserts were put into the structure so that we could uh, attach other components or um, use the brackets or attach other structural components to the bottom plate. And this brass insert is shown in its own specific spec sheet which are all called out on the overall spec sheet and the bill of materials. Now I will, oh, pardon me. These are part of our release documents, um, something that we put in a main database, which each shows the numbers and it gets built over time. Currently the configuration management is complete. It still needs to be directly put into the shared drive. I think we'll work with Dr. Gale on that, but it is fully complete and if you want to look at it after the presentation, it is on the table over there. And I will pass it back over to Clayton Jacobs for project review. Thank you, Scott. Alrighty, so in summary, we were able to meet all of our subsystem and system level requirements, and the capabilities of our completed functioning model include the tracking and excuse me, the optical tracking and targeting, also the maintaining of dynamic stability during test runs, and lastly, the autonomous operation of the system other than the user prompt. A user prompt was included but removed because when MATLAB prompts the user 
the system freezes to wait for the prompt. Unfortunately, we, we didn't want the system to become unstable during that time, so we removed the prompt to continue testing, or to continue functionality. We have a video here of its operation. I can kind of guide you through it as we watch it. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a computer screen. That computer screen is displaying the video captured from the onboard camera during the runtime. In the center of the screen, you'll see the actual system operating. So as the system begins to turn in its scanning phase, you'll see what it sees in the lower right-hand corner. After it completes two scans, the team deployed the target into its view. Unfortunately, you can't see it in this video, but it does apply a circle <coughs> over the red balloon image on the target stand, and then it slows down and begins to track. This is, of course, with no user input and acting with the MATLAB and Simulink functions only. It tracks back and forth in that one dimension, but if a person or another object is put in the field of view, um, particularly with a red object to identify, it can track you across the whole uh, safety area. All right, so as for an evaluation of the cost, we were under budget, both under our $1,200 extended limit and our $1,100 allotted limit. Uh, we were under by about $187. So, um, as for milestone schedule, these are some of the milestones we covered this semester. I did not include our preliminary design as well. Our conformity inspection was performed on the 4th of November. System testing, test reports, and user manual took an extended period of time, and they only ended very recently. And then today we have our system verification review. Estimated time contribution, it may be a little more clear on your uh, printouts there, but the total reported hours is just under 1,500 hours. So that was a surprise to me, although I didn't know what I should be expecting you can gauge from the chart that we are under what our professor thought we would be at at this point in time. <laughs> Some lessons learned. Uh, definitely leave the electronics to the double E's. Um, that's something I've learned over and over again at Ember Riddle, and uh, I'm going to stick with that. Also, grammar revisions, uh, some early documents had some issues, so we need to learn to do corrections early and often. And also, issues with the vendor, as the team who presented before us mentioned, we have a lot of issues getting spec drawings from companies for products that they were selling. They didn't even have you know, the, the drawings. Also, uh, order verification. What shipped to us was not necessarily what we ordered. So we had to do a couple revisions of that. And lastly, the shipping times. From the time we placed the order, that doesn't mean it gets shipped that day or even that week. So uh, that was something we did not factor into uh, on our schedule. Some acknowledgments. There are many professors at Embry-Riddle which we would like to thank for their support on our project. If you are interested in seeing a live demonstration, it is set up down in the Space Systems Lab of AxFab. We would like to begin a test at 1 p.m. if anyone is free to view that. Um, we'll have the target there for the system to track but if you happen to be wearing a red tie or you have another object present, we can attempt to track you across the field of view of the system as well. Um, it seemed to like Dr. Yale's tie the other day. That concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, I would be happy to source them. Um, thank you for your attendance. I just want to say, nice job. Uh, my name is Jacob Alder. I'm on my office campus, an aerospace engineer, and I'm currently working as a data analyst. Um, 
mostly because Michael here didn't want to ask all the questions. I've only got one question I can go to Michael. I <laughs> My question is for the structures team, or the team that was in charge of at least testing the structure. Uh, on sorry, the slides are not numbered. But about the test for this, the test for structural rigidity. Yes. Uh, you, Displacement transducer number one was faulty. Yes. Uh, but you were relying on data from three transducers. My question was, did you have a redundant number of transducers, and if not, why? Uh, we didn't have redundant uh, amount of transducers, but I mentioned that as an improvement. It's just uh, the number of transducers we had available uh, in AXFAB or from the structures and instrumentation lab. Um, and the reason why it was faulty is from that graph, you see as we're loading, the displacement starts increasing, and then we also uh, unloaded uh, back down the same increments. The thing is with the displacement of the transducer number one, we just put a five pound load, the voltage would shoot up saying it's like placed it over half an inch, and then we put uh, another five pound load on it, then it would come back down and say it was a negative displacement, so. So specifically the, the campus provided the transducers using the first Right, okay. Um, yeah, so actually while we're, while we're right here, this is sort of to reiterate the importance of redundancy in anything you can afford to do. Uh, that's really important. Uh, my first primary question is why did you choose to track red objects and why tracking the color? We'll go ahead and have Paul answer that question. Uh, the MATLAB uh, uh, toolbox that we had allowed the tracking of red objects, green objects, and blue objects. Um, we tested all three, and red worked the best. Okay. Uh, mainly, I'm just wondering as far as in contrast to say heat tracking from a burner or a simple, a simple electric heat. Um, if you go to slide, uh, slide over right, here. Some of them did. Well, basically, on, on the structural strength and the, and the weights, uh, where you had margins of safety and you had like an 823 margin of safety, yeah. um, later on, you had mentioned that you went over your weight budget. So, I mean, I guess uh, justification for, for so much uh, margin of safety and then, and then thereby passing it and then how you would, where you would cut down on your structure. So, where would I? Um, what I would say, uh, depth-wise, because it's uh, a foot in depth, probably cut it down there. Um, what are these uh, cross braces? Also, we could probably cut uh, the width of those in half. But it's just, of course, due to the amount of time for fabrication. Just still, this fell within the requirement. And except the weight, it wasn't a huge priority with the structure. Because, like I said, we had those management reserves. And although we went over the weight budget, the as far as the system requirements are concerned, we were under the required weight. So, uh, you know, we didn't meet the budget, but that's okay. Other subsystems were under, so the requirement was still there. Yeah, that's good. That's good to have safety. Um, as far as the batteries uh, being in close proximity to the board, where are the batteries exactly? Uh, if you can stand up here and check, but uh, they're down at the bottom. You see these red brackets? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. that's, that's where the bat batteries. Okay. So then heat or anything from the batteries is not a concern for the for the board. That's maybe what I'm wondering. Um, oh, for your lessons learned, um, electronics don't go away. So as far as leaving it to EEs, like I'm an AE and I'm currently working with batteries right now and it is all electrical. So if you can try and, and gear towards mechanical things, sure. Um, but be prepared for the fact that they don't go away, and you'll probably more than likely have to have to pick up those skills. Um, I think also on improvements. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. 
thing. Oh, uh, as far as the space application, I know you had downsides and everything. Uh, cameras and, and things like that. What were your original plans for, for tracking objects? So the original, the original object tracking uh, goal, uh, if we were to build the actual uh, system before the disco, would have been using uh, either radar or lidar in order to track those objects because we obviously wouldn't be able to get the resolution with the webcam at uh, the distances we're talking about for tracking objects in space. Um, so this this was a proof of concept, a descope mission, just to see if we could track it. And the the idea is that if we could track it with the webcam, we could track it with uh, a radar tracking system. Sure. Uh, it also it mentioned a laser uh, somewhere on, in the early slides. What was that about? So the system itself would operate on an ablative laser uh, for the non-descope, the actual satellite would, which means that the, the laser fires at an object slightly changes its mass, ultimately changing its orbital characteristics, and then hopefully deorbiting the object. Uh, there was an intent to attach a small handheld laser to the object to identify where the camera was actually centered at that time. Uh, although we had one, we didn't have batteries during our test, and so uh, that was removed. But um, nonetheless, we were able to identify the object. Did you do any studies on, on how far the, the laser would be effective? Like how close you'd have to get to an object in order to at this time, I do not recall. Um, it was done. If I remember correctly, we did do some analysis on that. Is that for me? Good job. Good job, guys. Um, I'm Dahlia Blue Juice. I graduated here in May, so I know most of you guys. I'm an aerospace engineer and currently working with testing at eval. So I only have a few questions. One, probably towards Patrick. Why did you guys do vibration testing? The reason why we didn't do vibration testing because we uh, determined that it was unnecessary. It wasn't going to be experiencing loads or it wasn't going to resonate, resonate for what it was doing. Even consulting with Professors Wick and Mark, Mark Sensmeyer, they even deemed that it would be unnecessary to do a vibration test. If you were to make it more space-like and space applicable, would you do a vibration test then? Yeah, most likely, okay. because if you're going to launch it, it's going to endure all that loading, vibrations, acoustics, everything. Of course, we conduct further tests. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, I guess for Cole, um, just to verify, the swivel is because the hose just constrains it, or if there's no hose there, would it continue just going in one direction the entire time? Uh, yes. Yeah, it would. Um, we only go, we do a, or at least the simulation wise, why it's plus or minus 90 degrees is because of the cord, because um, we had that planned out at the beginning. If you kept spinning it around, the cords would okay. um, I don't know so. if there's another reason for that. No, that was the whole reason behind it. And safety, too, um, was a concern. So. Okay, thank you. And on slide 82, it's stopped. So that 116 scale. In Katia, you click 116, or is that, if I printed that out on a piece of paper, would that be 116 to scale? Uh, the 116 scale was how it was originally scaled when they could have um, exported it out, but if you were to print that out, it would most definitely not be at 116 scale, because it's been rescaled since then. Just be careful about doing that, because some people are very literal, and anything you say, they'll take it as is, and they won't be able to <coughs> your fault because you didn't write it specifically. So just be careful for that in the future. So that's all. And then for the spec sheet, you probably know once you get industry, it never changes. So don't trust the spec sheets. You know, I know engineers that the spec sheet got received and we didn't even translate it because it was, an, it was a harness test. So just if there are going to be wrong numbers, you'll probably end up making your own spec sheet. So just don't trust them. Do it all yourself. Same thing happens with software. <laughs> yeah, software is the same thing, so. Good job, that's all I have. Scott Boo, I was here earlier, so I recognize both of you. Um, just wanted to <coughs> make a couple of comments. I really don't have hardly any questions at all. Um, the presentation was outstanding. Very professionally done, and largely great. The presenter did a very good job speaking. Um, clearly, you your stuff well, and it showed <coughs> that's important. Um, the only one kind of minor comment on Part 8 when he talked about the structure.
powerful test that you did on a sample. Mm -hmm. um, they learned that that's called coupon testing. I spend them all the time in the industry. So the word is coupon, that's kind of a nice term to use. Okay. Um, and that was, that was great, that was perfect. Perfect way to do it. Um, and really the only other, the only other comment is the same comment I had for the previous groups that, that have been presented today, is the lessons learned are things that you'll learn into over and over and over again. They're not the same, they're going to be exactly the same thing that you find in industry too, so. Um, just, just a really good project. Um, a lot of work, the analysis was outstanding. The simulations that you did was great. Uh, very, very good job. Hello everyone, my name is Carl Warren. probably met most of you at some point when we've been in class. Uh, I'm currently a mechanical engineer. I do CAD work, I've done TV work a little bit, and I graduated in May as well. Uh, and all great videos, all good presentation. One thing I really like is your slides are really big. I could actually read everything all. Really nice. <laughs> So I just have a few comments. Uh, one from the beginning, uh, what are your system requirements? Because maybe I just was looking down and didn't see them. I can't see them. <coughs> I believe system requirements were presented on much later in the presentation. Integration, in the integration section. Okay, there we go. Okay, because I was not on uh, when you guys came here. I'm there and so I was a little confused as to what you guys are trying to accomplish here. Uh, so this that pretty much easy on my part then. and then change them to me what we needed them to do. So. Okay, good. That's what we're going to do. And I guess the only comment I'm kind of wondering was just kind of what was said. Uh, I've heard a few times that we exceeded it, um, or we met it and exceeded it by a lot. So I was just kind of wondering, do you think your system is a little overbuilt, or do you think it's a good solution, or do you think it actually needs to be beefed up? Well, uh, I guess from the, the structure standpoint, yeah, we know it's over design, but of course one of the biggest driving factors is cost. So it's just since I work in the machine shop in Old Country, David I was able to pick his brain and he had material uh, that we could use for free at no cost to us. So yeah, we could make the structure small, smaller, we could use lighter material, but it was what was available to us. Okay. I'll also add that in the development of some of the requirements, we did analysis and we thought, you know, is this a realistic number that we could meet? And we thought, well, if it is, let's make it a little bigger. And I mean, overall, we met all the requirements and that's partially due to the requirements being designed so that they can be met. I think that's uh, part of our thought process there. But, okay. And a quick hypothetical question to you guys are using light uh, to track your targets. What kind of plant shadow? Did you guys get that far or was that outside your scope? So in the D-Scope uh, project, we'd be using uh, radar or LIDAR, as I mentioned earlier. Oh, okay. So the planet shadow thing isn't really an issue. Okay. As far as the actual system test, we didn't really plan on lighting being an issue until the testing occurred. <laughs> and then we found, not depending on the lighting, the camera could see objects which we never thought it could. It was in HD resolution, so it was picking out you know, tiny little pixels that appeared as red to the camera. It saw through the black sheet in some cases and found red objects throughout the room that we didn't think it would ever see. And then slightly changing the light also affected how it reacted with the target. Uh, turning the lights off and using a flashlight to illuminate the target seemed to work very well in our testing, but then you can't see the system operating. But uh, we did consider that. Okay, so that probably explain why you guys use the enclosed spaces in the 
these systems lab as opposed to a bigger room, which is that probably would make a problem worse. Even the light coming in from the two um, external windows made a difference in how the testing, uh, how the, the results of the testing. Okay. All right. Otherwise, yeah, it seems pretty good. Really cool. Uh, good job, you guys. <coughs> Hi guys, Ben Anderson, graduated in May, aerospace engineer, and currently doing verification validation and validation for modeling simulations. Um, first question to Pat on slides, uh, I guess, 14 and 17. <coughs> the, um, you're using a CGT to do all of your structural analysis. Yes. Did you ever consider using Ansys? Yes, but again, just from experience, but construction, we knew the system was going to be over designed. And we know CATIA is not, was it a good tool to use to do finite element analysis, but it was a good use of our time to get the numbers close to what we need. Um, then to slide 26. Should have uh, been more clear, um, but what it's saying is that um, that it's able to basically able to control the system, so that when it brings in the information, say um, whatever the yaw angle is or the roll and pitch, if it's past, uh, if it's starting, it can use the position and the angular velocity to determine which direction to fire, so that it's not say it brings in a positive uh, three degree angle and pitch and a positive velocity and then continues to fire in the positive direction. Uh, so that's what that is meant to show that it uh, will fire correctly. Okay. In your uh, actual requirements document, have it be a little bit more specific okay. about the acceptability criteria, like maybe a range of like error values. All right. Um, that's good. Thank you. And then uh, Jacob, um, slide 53, you're doing the uh, temperature analysis of the power rates. You gave a great description of this, and then you said this the uh, copper wasn't the same thickness as the ones you actually used? Right. So is this not the same board that you used? So this is a analysis of just one power rail. Um, the components are the same components, shown in the same configuration. The only difference is that in our actual system, we have four power rails, four exact copies of this uh, stamped over each other. The other difference between this simulation is that the uh, the simulated board up here uses four planes of copper, in, two internal planes and two external planes, one on the top, one on the bottom, and two in the middle. Uh, the design of these power converters has a metal plane on the bottom of the IC, and that's meant to uh, have thermal vias going under the board through all the planes of copper to disperse the heat. So um, if we had two ounce copper on the bottom and two ounce copper on the top, sorry, two ounce on the bottom, two ounce on the top, um, that would allow for better heat dissipation just because the thicker copper can transport the heat further away. Um, being that this is a student project, that would have cost over $1,000 for that board uh, to be custom fabricated. We do so, very well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I tried very hard and they would not budge on that price. <laughs> so um, we have a one, one ounce copper on the top, one ounce copper on the bottom. There's no in between copper. So um, that, what that means is that the heat doesn't transfer away from the chip quite as quickly. So because of that, that accounts more than accounts for uh, the temperature difference in, actual, in, in reality versus the simulation. Okay, did you actually measure in reality when Yes. Okay. That's that's what the oh, uh, typical measure temperature. temperature. Yes. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. And that was my last question. Thank you. Yeah, great job. Okay. I know there's one burning question from the audience. I don't know if there are others. Go ahead, sir. I always had a question in terms of your attitude and determination. Because you mentioned error values. Did you ever test to see what your actual accuracy of your attitude and determination was being an outside source? And then also in terms of that for YAW, since that was <coughs> Um, 
so uh, for the stability, uh, we were unable to get an outside source, so those air values come directly from the IMU, which obviously is going to have some air in it. Um, and uh, frankly, to solve the uh, yaw issue, it's just getting the angle from the camera, and then you just add it to your current position, and you're able to follow an object quite easily. Did you have a compass on the uh, yeah, yeah, we did have the magnetometer work too. So. You guys didn't have a camera on board, so. No. Because if you're determining it, anything else from the uh, floor? Okay, all right. Uh, I think this piece of. Uh, Thank you, Dennis.